James chapter 2. We've been studying in the, the book of James here. and We've considered this idea of living as a first century Christian. James is the first book in your New Testament to actually be penned. We understand that the chrono, it's not chronological as far as where the books are placed. And uh, James is dealing as the pastor of the Jerusalem church. And he is saying that what does first century Christianity look like? They knew what Judaism had become. The Pharisees had made a show of it. It was empty. The Bible said, Jesus said of them, you're whited sepulchers, you're, you're clean cups on the outside, but inside you're full of extortion, and inside you're full of dead man's bones. And So what does first century Christianity look like? What does it look like to live as a first century Christian? And that's what James is helping us to see, uh, to be like what Christ described in the Sermon on the Mount as we've been preaching through there on Sunday morning. And so the book of James is about Christian belief and behavior. And our belief is to determine our behavior. Someone said, uh, what we actually believe, we practice. Everything else is just religious talk. And that's, there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? What we actually believe is what we live, not just say with our mouth. If we speak of our beliefs and do not follow through with appropriate behavior... It's evidence that something's wrong with our beliefs. Something's not right. Something doesn't add up in this equation. And of course, fa- of course, faith is a key doctrine of the Word of God. We're coming to looking at Abraham's faith in just a moment here in James 2. And faith all the way through, of course, is a key doctrine uh, in the Christian life. The sinner's saved by faith, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. That's pretty important. That's how we all got saved, if you know the Lord Jesus, your Savior tonight. And of course, the Bible says the believers to walk by faith, that we find in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith, not by sight. And then, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, faith is pretty important. I can't get saved without faith. I'm supposed to live every day and walk every step by faith. And then, I can't even please God without faith, Hebrews eleven six, 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say it's hard to please God. It says it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And then he talks about faith... Uh, is uh, whatever we do apart from faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin, he says at the end of that verse. And so it's a pretty powerful subject in the Word of God. Wouldn't you agree? (laughs) Someone has said that faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. That's interesting. Faith is not just believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. You read Hebrews chapter 11, you don't find people that were uh, assenting to something, giving an intellectual assent to something. You find people that acted because of their faith. And they weren't concerned with consequence. Take Moses, for example. He said no to the pleasures of sin for a season. He said no to Pharaoh's riches. And what did he say? Accounting, esteeming the riches of God greater treasure than the riches in Egypt. You see, it cost something. It wasn't just something they said they believed and shook their head and, and nodded in agreement. No, this was something that they had an action behind. And so quite something as you study what the Bible says, especially is what we call the he- Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. These were men and women who acted on God's word no matter what price they had to pay. Faith is not some kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling that we work up and think, boy, it feels good. Uh, faith is confidence that God's word is true. It's practical. It's a daily walk. It's a conviction that acting on that word will bring his blessing. Even though it doesn't make sense. Uh, the modern church, the progressive church we see all around us, they believe that if it works, it must be right. But that's not what we believe. We believe what the Bible says and that if it's right, God will bless it and it will work in His time. If it's right. And so uh, that's what we believe. Uh, God's Word is right and He'll bless the obedience of His Word. So James chapter 2, we've been studying 
uh, here through the book of James, we'll begin reading verse 14 of James 2. We'll read through the end of the chapter. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say, uh, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Now, he's asking some powerful questions here. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, a faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. I was going to say three times here, that faith without works is dead. Verse 17, verse 20, and verse 26. It binds this whole passage together, this theme. Faith without works is dead. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. See, what James is challenging right there is he's saying, it's impossible for you to show me your faith without your works. <laughs> impossible. I mean, you can say you believe something all day, but unless you show me an evidence as a result of what you believe, that would be works. And you cannot show it without works. James says, but I'll show you my faith by my works. Because the only way we know it's genuine is by the works. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 7? We looked at this morning. By their fruits, you shall know them. You can't open someone up and see the root of faith. You can't open someone up and see if it's genuine. But by their life, God says, the fruit gives evidence of something. By their fruits, you shall know them. Keep reading verse 19. Thou believest that there is, on, thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Number two. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers? And it sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Third time. We're bringing a message tonight entitled, The Friend of God. The Friend of God. Can we pray together? Father, help us now. Open our eyes, we ask, to behold wondrous things out of thy law. Pray you'd help what I say to be clear. Lord, I want to give any indication of false doctrine or something that your word does not say, but that all of us would be vigilant in the listening and having our ears to hear that we might, by your Spirit, understand your word and apply it to our life. We well, thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to know, God says he's not a respecter of persons. We already studied that in James, didn't we? And God says here that Abraham was called the friend of God. I want to say to each and every one of you, you can be God's friend. God desires for you to be his friend. Isn't that amazing? He says here, Abraham was called the friend of God in verse 23. But every believer can become the friend of God. Isn't that amazing to think about our God, that he would desire us as friends? <laughs> Sometimes we might be impressed if someone says they know so-and-so or that type of thing. And pray for Aaron. He's sick tonight, uh, Aaron Bibb. He left after Sunday school. wasn't feeling well. It started last night, he said. But he sent me a picture Friday night of him and Dabo Sweeney. Well, that's the Kent Clemson coach. For you that don't know college football, they won the national championship last year. Uh, he claims to be a Christian. He has outspoken testimony. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Shared that at the halftime Friday night. And uh, I wasn't there, but I just, what I heard about it. But he got a picture with him. And, uh, but some of you, that would mean something. Some of you, that wouldn't. Obviously, Nick Saban, everyone here, I'm sure, would know and so on. But the truth is, you knowing him or someone saying, yeah, he's my friend, uh, people might think, yeah, okay, whatever. But what would be impressive is not that you said he's your friend, but what be, would be impressive is if Nick Saban or Dabba Sweeney or any of these said, Ron Haas, that's my friend. Everyone would be like, whoa, did you hear what he said, right? All of us want to be their friend, naturally. We'd want to, you know, because there's someone important who would think that's a big feather in our cap. I'm friends with 
some senator I'm friends with, the president, or, you know, it's one thing for us to say, but it's another thing for them to say. So-and-so is my friend. Well, here's God saying, this isn't Abraham saying God's my friend. God is saying Abraham is my friend. That's quite something. It's not just once. I don't have time to take it tonight, but you can find it throughout the Bible. It's multiple times in Isaiah, in Genesis, uh, in the Chronicles. I can't remember all the places that the Bible records that Abraham was the friend of God. Quite something. But I want you to get back to the faith here, and unless you get faith right, you can never be God's friend. Never. See, the Lord Jesus made much of friendship. John 15, we've already read. Friendship is a gift from God. And along with Rahab, God uses Abraham here to illustrate the life of true faith. Now, this is an important discussion that James gives. Because if we're wrong on this matter, on the matter of faith, we jeopardize our eternal salvation, our eternal destination. So what kind of faith really saves a person anyway? Is it necessary to perform good works in order to be saved? How can a person tell whether or not he himself is exercising true saving faith? How do I know? Well, two things tonight. Number one, we're going to look at faith. And number two, we're going to look at friendship. Number one, faith. We see three kinds of faith described here. And only one is true saving faith. Notice he says, first of all, I think you probably already got it. The first one is dead faith. (laughs) Dead faith, right? Verse 14, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute, so he gives an illustration. All right, guy comes in, and he's talking about coming into the church. He's talking about some family coming in, and they're, they're destitute of daily needs, the basic needs you'll find all through the Scripture, having food and raiment. Let, him, let us therewith be content, right? Matthew uh, chapter 6, we just finished studying. He says, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Those are the basic needs that God points out all the way through Scripture. Not even shelter. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. But at least food and clothing. Those are the basic needs that God gives. Now, if you listen to political parties, they're going to say you have a right to a cell phone and have a right to cable and have a right to health care and all this. But that's not what God says. God says just the basic needs are that. And so uh, he's saying, if someone comes in and, good night, they don't have food, we're going to take them to our kitchen, aren't we? I mean, we've got bread back here and all kinds of cakes, and we've got some canned goods, even a few things, and we're going to give them food, no question. They don't even have clothes. We're going to find out about the, who has some clothes that are similar size. And I mean, they're coming to our church, and they need something. We're going to try to help. That's basic need. That guy doesn't even have a, a clothes to wear. The, this kid's in a T-shirt that's three, four sizes too big, right? We're thinking, you know, we're asking... Is there some need here? And we realize there is. We're going to find out who has a kid that's about that age, but a little bit bigger, and who could give some clothes, right? We're going to try to help them, aren't we? That would be natural. That's what he's saying here, but that's not what happened. Notice verse 16, And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? What good does it do that you said those words if you don't help them? Now, I think you're not helping most people that are asking for money on the side of the road something if you give them money. In fact, I don't give them money. I wouldn't advise you to give them money. I've had guys holding a sign, we'll work for food, and I've handed out a piece of fruit, and they don't want it. They won't take it. So they're not hungry, most of them. It's funny, people that want to work, you can't stop them from finding work. There's work to be found, isn't there? So I'm not talking about just where to give to everything, and that's what God's calling us to. He's calling us to... The, someone with basic needs that they don't have. We, have. we live in a culture today that people come in and demanding, give me that, I need this. We're supposed to give it to them, you know. I'm serious. Stay around the church here for a week. They'll, they come right in. The one came in this morning, actually. And, and aggressive, and, and, and you don't give it to them, they get angry and leave. And uh, we're kind. We try to, the greatest gift we give anyone is the bread of life, and we try to offer them food, but I'm not going to give someone... Cash money. Regardless of all that, that's how people are many times in our day. But this is talking about someone that has basic needs. And and it doesn't come in saying they're demanding that you provide them. But we can see there's a need here. They've come in and they don't have anything. They're destitute. And you go to them and say, I'll be praying you get some food. I'll be praying you get some clothes. Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So he's talking about dead faith. Now remember, 
Anytime there's something true or real, there's always a counterfeit. And to everything that God does, the devil has an imitation. The devil has a counterfeit to everything God does. And so uh, there's an imitation faith here, a dead faith. Remember Matthew 7, 21, this morning we touched on it. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Why would someone do the will of the Father which is in heaven? Because they have been born into that family and he is their father. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is his. There is some dead faith out there. In fact, he says, many will say in that day, Lord, didn't we do this? And Lord, and I'll say what? Depart from me. Many, he says. So I want to say, uh, before I get too far, the big controversy, if you've read any on this passage, is they're going to say Paul and James were disagreeing. Now, Paul says in Galatians this, and and then in Romans such, and and James is saying here, and they're actually at odds. Martin Luther is famous for saying that James' book is an epistle of straw, and he didn't like James' book. But I think he didn't have an understanding of James' book because there's only one author in the Bible, and that's the Holy Spirit. The rest are all just human penmen. But regardless of that, that's what people will say, that they're at odds, and the Scripture is, is, is at odds here. But I want to submit to you tonight they're in perfect agreement. They're just coming from different angles, different viewpoints on the same subject. Uh, Verse 14, for instance, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? James is simply saying that the faith which saves you will produce works of faith. I've never touched a 220-volt wire. I don't have any intention of doing it, a live wire. But I want to tell you, if you come into contact with 220 volts of electricity, it'll change you. It's going to change you. Don't tell me you're coming in contact with the creator of heaven and earth. And he's taken up his abode in you. And you've not been changed enough for people around you to say, that person's different. Something's happened. We find the Christian experience throughout the Word of God is that as people got saved, there was great evidence. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. People were scared when the demoniac Gadara is now sitting and seated and in his right mind. What's happened? Jesus changed him. So uh, there is a change that comes. Apparent controversy here that people think. But Paul made it clear that men are not saved by the law, but later in the same epistle, he says this. Let me read you Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So be like, oh, there's a controversy here. But listen to Paul later in the same book, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Interesting, there's a lot of doing that goes along with believing. Let us not be weary in well-doing. One theologian said, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. And notice what he said in verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. What? Being dead. Alone. Alone. Both Paul and James taught that faith must be a working faith. We're going to come to Romans, what Paul says in just a minute. But saving faith, therefore, is a lie. Professing faith is dead. People with dead faith, they substitute words for deeds. They can really talk the talk. They know all the statements. They know all the phrases. They've got the pious cliches and Christian verbiages down. And they can say, oh, bless you, brother, like he says in verse 16, be, be warmed and filled, depart in peace. But it doesn't do them any good. People with dead faith substitute words for deeds. Isn't that what James already dealt with? Hey, don't deceive yourself, but be you doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Words are not enough, there must be deeds, see. They think words are as good as works, and they're wrong. May I say to you, you are telling with your life, not your lips, but with your life, whether your faith is genuine or not. All of us are. We're telling. 
We've all met people who say they believe whatever, but then their lives contradict what they say they believe. There was a man at Moody Bible Institute. I'd love to share his whole story. It's about three pages in my notes. I don't have time to do it. But he believed in demonstrating faith by works. His name was George Verver. You ought to look it up. V-E-R-W-E-R. Even in his day, students uh, believed in, and could see that it was evident that the world was going to hear from him. He was a committed soul winner. He was a successful motivator, had a world vision. He would get many of his fellow students to go after places in Chicago and blitz target zones with tracks and intensive soul winning efforts. And George Verver, from the start, had a vision for the untold millions untold. And first he went to Mexico. And they said, you can't go to Mexico that's closed, and back then, Romanism, really, Roman Catholic Church had a stronghold still in Mexico. And not only are you you're going to be in prison or maybe killed, it's illegal to go there. And yet, that didn't stop him. His life text was, nothing should be impossible unto you, Matthew 17, 20. Nothing should be impossible unto you. And so his was the kind of faith that moved mountains, and he got to the Mexican customs with all these gospel books and tracts. And someone said, you'll never even get through customs. You're not even going to get across the border. They're going to arrest you. He was praying, nothing's impossible unto God. They got there. All the Mexican guards were drunk. Passed them right on through, never even looked. Now they're in the country. And on and on his story goes. And God used him in a great way in Mexico. They had all these books. And he says, what am I going to do? Again, he fell back on his text. Nothing's impossible with God. So George, uh, like a businessman, approached the radio stations in Mexico. He said, I've got a series of books uh, on bookstores. I would like to buy time to tell people about books that we have on sale. And so it worked. His Mexican partners, uh, he and his Mexican partners got on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special offer this week. We've secured these religious books and and, and uh, one was called Peace with God. Do you have peace with God? Let me read you a paragraph from this book. And he'd start reading it right on the radio. George graduated from Moody Bible Institute. They went, he went to Spain. You'll end up in prison in Spain, they told him. George just leaned hard on his text. Nothing should be impossible. Again, uh, he had to get in a different way. You couldn't go to Spain as a missionary at this time, and so he had to enroll in the University of Madrid, and he took just the minimum amount of classes to be a bona fide student so he could be there and gave the rest of his time to evangelism. And he, he started studying because they were so steeped in Catholicism what the fathers of Rome taught and began compiling things that they would be okay with, that they had put out that were scriptures that would lead to salvation. Put them all together and gospel tracts began to publish them. They were all quotations from the church fathers that Rome revered. He found the edition of the Spanish New Testament and, uh, that was free of Romish annotations. And one of that had the imprimatur of Rome, had the seal of Rome on it. He was in business. These were the materials that he distributed wholesale. How could the Roman Catholic Church attack him? He was distributing the writings of its own fathers. And God did something miraculous in Spain. Then he went to Russia. And finally, he was put in prison in Russia. Same thing happened. You shouldn't go there. They interrogate him. Uh, they, they were, the Russian people, he said to them, you say the Bible's full of lies to these interrogators. George said, then why are you so afraid of it if it's full of lies? In the end, they were given an armed escort out of the country, and all their books, bibles, and tracts were confiscated. And George said, good. You can be quite sure that those guards will read the Bibles and literatures, if only out of curiosity. By this time, he had begun praying for a ship. He said, as you looked at the atlas, all the great cities of the world were on the waterways. And so he said, I, I need a ship. Lord, give me a gospel ship. Begin praying, God would give me a ship. He was praying for all these things. He felt like one night God was saying, George, if I gave you a ship, what would you do with it? And he told him, he told the Lord, and he was praying what he would do with it. And he said, but yeah, but who's going to be the captain of it? He said, oh, you're right, Lord. I need to pray for a captain and a crew. And he began praying, and God provided all that. And George was given his first boat. He called it the Logos. Then he got his second one. He called it the Doulos. It was the story, if you can look it up, Operation Mobilization. One miracle after another. Some years ago, the mission stated that its teams had encountered some 250 million people face to face, not counting the radio ministry, in that uh, confronting them with the gospel. 
And during that same period, it had reached 150 million Indian nationals with the gospel. Now, I don't know much about that. I was not even familiar with this guy until I read his story. I'm just saying, faith without works is dead. Here's a man that didn't just say, I believe God could do something, but began to believe God and act upon that faith. Nobody would accuse George Verver of having dead faith. James would like him. Look at verse 17 and 18. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say that I have faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. Faith, if it hath works, if it hath not works, is dead. Why? Why is that true? Because living faith, saving faith, produces works. It just does. That's what God teaches. That's what you find throughout the Bible. James is talking about the fruit of faith. Whereas Paul and his writings are talking about the root of faith. But both Paul and James say that faith alone saves. Again, we're coming to Romans 4 and comparing with this in just a minute. There was a minister that talked to a man one time. And he professed he was saved, professed he was, was converted. And he said, well, why have you never united with the church? He said, the thief on the cross, dying thief on the cross, never united with the church. He said, well, why haven't you ever got baptized? The dying thief on the cross never got baptized. Preacher asked him, have you ever taken the Lord's table, come to the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper? The dying thief never took the Lord's Supper. He was accepted. Pastor asked him, have you ever tithed and given to missions? The dying thief never tithed and gave to missions. <laughs> on and on like that. Finally, the minister was so disgusted, he said, well, my friend, the difference between you two seems to be that he was a dying thief and you are a living thief. You know, the truth is, how often we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, but we won't sing with the one tongue God's given us. You won't glorify God with the tongue God's given you. Why should God give you a thousand? Oh, if all the realm of, of nature was mine, right? We sing, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present, that was an offering far too small. And then we give nothing at all to Him of what we do have. James says, if it's faith that saves, saving faith produces something. So dead faith, number two. The second faith you see here is demonic faith. Demonic faith. Look at verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils or demons also believe and tremble. Hey, lip service is not the evidence of saving faith. Even the demons believe. He's saying, show me your life. You're saying, all is it with your lips? If you can't show me your life to back it up, the demons are right there with you. They'll say it with their lips too. We have it on record in God's Word. James wanting here to shock his audience a little bit. He uses demons as an illustration. But you think about it. What do demons believe? Demons believe in the existence of God. They're ahead of some people. No, no atheist demons... There's no agnostic demons out there. They all believe in God. A deity of Christ, they believe it. They knew who Jesus was. Jesus had to keep shutting them up. They would give profession of who Jesus was. The existence of hell, oh, they knew that. Please don't cast us into the deep. Lord, send us to those pigs. They knew there was judgment coming. They knew Jesus was Lord. They submitted to the power of His Word. The demons had some good things going for them. <laughs> as far as their theology. And what he's doing here is interesting if you think about uh, uh, the, the daily affirmation of faith for a godly Jew was Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. That was the daily affirmation for a godly Jew. And here he says in verse 18, Yea, a man may say, and all of them were saying it. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe in tremble. Almost a hint of sarcasm. Hey, even the demons believe that. Oh, they tremble at it too. They shudder at the name of God. 
So two kinds of faith that can never save a sinner is dead faith, intellect alone, just something that's professed, just something in the brain, and demonic faith, the intellect and the emotions. Here they are. They, they believe it, they profess it, and they also shudder. Their heart melts in them. The only kind of faith that can save is dynamic faith, the third faith. Dead faith, you see here, demonic faith, and then we find dynamic faith. Look at verse 20. But wilt thou, O vain man, that... But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And here he gives two illustrations now of dynamic faith, Abraham and Rahab. We're going to read it in just a minute. See, dynamic faith is faith that is real. Dynamic faith is faith that has power. Dynamic faith is faith that results in a changed life. See, object is everything when it comes to faith. We hear and talk to people today, and they have faith in faith. I just hold on to my faith. But you look at their lives, that faith isn't in God, evidently, because their life is nothing that lines up to the Word of God. Oh, I have my faith. In the hard times, I lean on my faith. Faith in what? On a mission trip. Oh, thank the Lord it wasn't me or one of us. Uh, we were sitting in these, uh, that's where, the, in a lot of mission fields is this way. In South Africa there, they had chairs, but not nice chairs like this or pews like this. They were lawn chairs. Uh, just cheap plastic, you know, the cheap chairs you can buy that are just plastic-formed chairs. And uh, as they got older, uh, they would begin to get brittle, the heat and stuff, and they would crack a little bit, and they'd put them where the children sat because the children are lighter. And so, uh, but every once in a while, an adult would go back there sitting with them, and this is what happened during one of the services. Uh, one of the ladies that was there that was not with our group, but it was there, had been there for a number of weeks, sat in one of the chairs that had the crack in, and all of a sudden, boom, and you know, sprawled like this. She had faith. But the object where faith wasn't worthy. And so all of us, you're, you're all exhibiting faith right now. Some of you really believe in me. You sit there with your eyes closed. I mean, you really trust me. I could be going through your purse. I could come punch you, wouldn't even know it, you know. But you're all exhibiting faith by seeing those pews, right? All of us. But so faith isn't the thing. We all get in our car, we believe it's going to start, right? We get on an elevator, and we don't test the elevator. We don't see the look at the certificate, who checked it last. We don't even think about it. We just have faith, get on it. But faith, the object is the key, see. Dynamic faith is based on God's Word. The Word produces faith, doesn't it? By the Word of God, Romans tells us. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It involves the whole man. See, dead faith touches only the intellect. Demonic faith involves both the mind, the intellect, and the emotions. They shuddered, they trembled. But dynamic faith involves all three. Mind, emotions, and will. See, the mind understands the truth. The heart desires the truth. But the will determines to act upon the truth. Hebrews 11, you find people that didn't just hear, they didn't just understand, they didn't just feel something, they acted upon it. And by faith they did this, and by faith did that, and by faith, by faith. He said, so they were saved by their, act, their works, their actions? No, the faith, because they believed, produced an action. We're going to get to that, at least two examples. God spoke and they obeyed. Again, faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of consequence. And that's what they did in Hebrews 11. So James now gives two illustrations of this dynamic faith that led to action, led to good works. And that leads us to number two, not just faith, but friendship. Friendship. Look at verse 20 through 26. We read verse 20. Look at 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? He's asking a question. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, you couldn't find two more different Bible characters than Abraham and Rahab. <laughs> I mean, Abraham, think of Abraham. Abraham's a Jew. Rahab's a Gentile. 
Abraham is godly. Rahab is sinful, identified as a harlot all through the scriptures. Abraham's the friend of God. Rahab is a part of the enemies of God, part of Jericho. The ones they were going to destroy. What they have in common? Both exercised faith in God. Verse 22, we find the perfect relationship between faith and works. Look at it. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect or whole or complete. See, someone said that Abraham was not saved by faith plus works, but by faith that works. Faith that works. Dynamic faith obeys God, improves itself in daily life and works. Unfortunately, we still have church members who fit the description that Paul gave in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, Titus 1, 16. What we should have, of course, is what he described in Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And so you find Rahab's story in Joshua chapter 2 and following. And Rahab uh, said, We've been hearing about you all for 40 years. Our faith and our hearts melted when we, when we heard what you did the Egyptians and what God did for you as you came out. We've heard. And she acted upon that and she said, I believe God. She was justified before God by her faith. Listen to Hebrews eleven thirty one. 31. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Other people had heard the same thing, but she did something they didn't do. She believed. By faith, she didn't perish. She believed. But what did that belief do? Hebrews eleven thirty one 31 says, when she had received the spies with peace. So because by faith she believed God, she then acted and received these spies. Look, before her own people and before the Israelites... She was justified by works. Now, they couldn't see inside her and know what she believed or not, but what they did see was when the whole walls of Jericho fell, her house stayed standing. What she did, they did see, or they maybe didn't know, but she took her life and put her life on the line when she hid those spies. Had they found them in her house, she could have lost her life. Then she was even more daring as one of the first soul winners in the Bible. She had to win her family over without them turning her in. As they said they have to be in the house, all of them. They can't go out when we attack. When the walls fall, they better be in this house. If anyone goes out, blood's on their hands. They've got to stay in. Quite something. Makes you think a lot about John 4 and the woman at the well, doesn't it? Rahab's story goes well with it. Rahab hid the spies. She risked her life. Her actions demonstrated a testimony of great faith. Rahab acts on her faith. She acted because she had faith. The work she did was not done to save her, but because she was already a believer. But before men, it was her works that justified her. It was the works that proved and showed that she had genuine faith. And that's what the Bible is certainly saying in Hebrews 11 there. It's what he's saying here James chapter 2. Rahab becomes one of the first soul winners. <laughs> Begins witnessing to people around her. When you realize the small amount of light Rahab had, you begin to think how truly amazing her faith is. I mean, you compare that to us. She had heard some story. I don't even know, the Bible didn't even tell us how she heard it. But somehow word got around that there's this nation that there was slaves in Egypt, and their, Moses led them out. And the, I mean, the Red Sea parted, and the chariots of, of Pharaoh and, and, and the armies of, of uh, Egypt were destroyed, trying to come through the same. And I mean, this story's got out. And she heard it. She acted on the little light that she had. She said, "I believe God." Now I don't understand how she got it. I don't know how it all happened. But she took the one chance she had for salvation. The one time that the gospel came to her, 
and she seized the opportunity. It's amazing. Today we have full revelation of God's word. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on your computer. You can get it at any bookstore. Get it at Walmart. Get it at the dollar store. The Bible is readily available. She didn't have any of that. Not only that, we live after Calvary. We understand what Jesus did in the atonement for our sins and all the mysteries of the Old Testament we have. Boy, it makes you think about Luke 12, 48, who much is given, much is going to be required. Rahab acted on the light she had. With both hands she seized her one chance of salvation. It's funny, Rahab would end up marrying one of those two spies, Salmon. Give birth to Boaz. End up in the hall of faith. Powerful faith. Powerful works. The Lord lifts her up as an example here in James 2. Then we see Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 and follow. You can follow his story. But Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 it says this. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. And God counted it to him for righteousness. Same thing we find here in Verse 23, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or accounted. It's a banking term, an accounting term, unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So Genesis 15, 6 says that. Do you understand that Abraham believed God, and it was 48 years, people believe, but at least 40-plus years before you get to Genesis 22. So you're telling me that all this time James is saying that Abraham was lost? Read verse 22. Or verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works? When? When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. So for 40 plus years, Abraham in all that time wasn't a believer. He wasn't saved. It wasn't till that act. Well, you don't believe that, neither do I. God gave testimony in Genesis 15 that he believed God and he counted it to him for righteousness. So James obviously isn't saying that. Rather, Abraham's works proved his faith. It's one thing to say that you're a Christian. It's another thing to live the Christian life and have people say about you, I'm telling you, there's a difference, there's evidence in that person that they're a Christian. That's what James is saying is in Abraham. Both should be a part of us. We should say with our mouth, I'm a believer, and then our life ought to back it up. We are demonstrating the change in our lives every day. Why? Because there really has been a change. Can you imagine the change in our country of professing Christians in America would actually act and live like Christians? Could you imagine the change in our church if the professing Christians in our church actually begin to act like Christians and live like Christians? I mean, like we've been describing in God's Word in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Let's make it personal. Can you imagine your home if those of you that profess Christians would act and live daily like Christians. We're talking about a change in our lives. That's certainly what our nation needs. That's what our church needs. That's what our home needs. Lord, help me to be a Christian like God's Word says one ought to be. Abraham showed that. Like baptism is an outward demonstration of an inward decision, an inward reality. The Bible says we're raised to walk in newness of life. It, it doesn't save us. But it's a picture of what's happened when you got saved. The Lord Jesus came in. Death to the old man. Death to my old life. I was headed to hell and destruction, but I've repented. I've turned from that now to Christ. If you're not saved here tonight, Jesus wants to save you if you'd be willing to repent of your sin and turn from that life that way and turn to Jesus Christ tonight. He'd save you, give you everlasting life. The eternal one would come to live within you. No doubt about it. And when we stand in the water of baptism, that doesn't save us. No, Baptism is just a picture of what's already happened. I've been raised to walk in newness of life. Miraculously, Christ has come to live within me. But not just that. I've been placed in Christ, the Bible says. We're in Him. It's almost like this, this uh, bucket of water here. Here you've got a bucket of water and you've got a sponge. You pull this sponge out of the water... And you say, what's true? Is the sponge in the water or is the water in the sponge? Well, both. Are you in Christ or is Christ in you? Both. 
So, is your faith proved by what you say? By how you live? Well, both. See, it changes your mouth. That's why it says be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So you think about what he's saying there. Why use drunkenness? Because drunken people talk different. Drunken people walk different. Drunken people act different. And see, it's to change us from the inside out. We have a new life. Christ has come in, and I'm in Christ. Now go with me to Romans chapter 4, would you? Romans 4, and hold your place in James. Don't lose it, because we're going to compare two passages that say very similar things. Romans chapter 4. You may think tonight, look, James, you tell me what it's saying, I'll believe you. But if you begin studying, you begin door knocking, talking to people, people will point this out as an area to say you have to live it to keep it. You have to live it to have salvation. But that's not what the Bible is saying. You need to be armed to see what the Bible says. Look at Romans chapter 4 and James chapter 2. Just three verses in Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertained to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Key phrase. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, I don't know how God could be more clear here. He's talking about how he was justified, not before God, but before men. See what it says there, verse 2? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. He wasn't justified before God by works. All right, go to James chapter 2 now. Look again at what we said, verse 21 to 23. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So what he's saying is just simply that when he did that work, when that action happened, everybody in the world knew something about Abraham. Abraham believed God. Abraham was justified to man, before men with his action. Rahab, the same thing. Rahab had already believed God, but they couldn't see that. But when her house stood, when she protected those spies, she was justified by her works before men but not before God. Genesis 15, the Bible says that Abraham, 40-some years earlier, he believed God when God told him what he was going to do, and he, by faith, believed what God said, and God said he counted unto him for righteousness. He imputed the same term we used when God took our sin, and he took our sin and put on our account his righteousness. The same thing happened. We couldn't do that for ourselves. Abraham couldn't have done that for himself. No one could. But God, because he believed God, counted him for righteousness. He imputed his righteousness to his account. And so they're both agreeing together. No contradiction between Romans or Galatians or James. Same Holy Spirit wrote it. But God imputed, he accounted. It's a baking term. God fixed the books. He did that for Abraham and he did it for you. And he's done it for me. We were sinners. We were hell deserving. But God counted our faith for righteousness and gave us his robe of righteousness. We could never have done it. Abraham's life was a series of surrenders. You see Abraham surrendering at Ur when God said, Come on, Abraham, we're going walking. He left, not knowing where, whither he went. You see Abraham surrender when it came to the well-watered plains. You don't think Abraham liked green grass? You don't think Abraham could see this is better for cattle? Abraham was no dummy. But he said, God, I want to go where you have for me. Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't where God had for him. He surrendered. Abraham surrendered when he had to give up Hagar and Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. God said, go ahead and do it. Sarah's saying, send them away. He surrendered. And then, of course, the great surrender that all those other surrenders were preparing him for, he surrendered in the case of Isaac, Mount Moriah. Amazing, God's friends. Amazing. Imagine God pointing out to the angels, hey guys, look down there. See that one there? He's my friend. Abraham's my friend. So of course from time to time he had to drop in on Abraham. And he did. Sometimes brought some angels with him, didn't he? 
See, God has many children, but he doesn't have many friends. Naturally, God wants you to be his friend. God calls us friends. God says, I've been a friend to you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. See, the Lord doesn't have to prove anything to us. He doesn't have to do anything for us. He says, look at Calvary. I'm your friend. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But if you'd like to be my friend, you're my friends if you keep my commandments. If you do what I've commanded you. He's already your friend. He's proven that. But if you'd like to be his, he says, obey me. God calls us to friendship. Oh, Abraham, you, John 15, he talks about that. God calls us to fellowship. Mark 3, 14, he called them to be with him and then send them forth to preach. God calls us to workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2, we quoted verse 8 and 9. We all know that for by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God before ordained that we should walk in them. I want to tell you, when the world looks at you, they see God. Some of us, they're getting a bad, twisted view of God. Remember, the Bible says, you have not so learned Christ. Hey, your heavenly Father is being judged as they see you. You're God's workmanship. It's like this pulpit. If I said I made pulpits, I want to sell you a pulpit. Look at my workmanship. Look how nice of peace I made. God is pointing at you saying, these are my Christians. These, this is my child. This is my son. This is my daughter. We're the epistles that all men read. What representation of Christ are we? We're his workmanship. All right. I'm through. Here's the test. Are you ready for the test? I know I didn't tell you it was going to be a test. We're done. See, God gives an opportunity here. Any person on earth can have an intimate fellowship, friendship with him. He wants to say, that man, that woman's my friend. He says, James 4, 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. There's no question about it. He's not a respecter of persons. You can be his friend. But here's the test. I'll give you nine questions. I'm just going to read them. That's it. Now, it's important because each professing Christian needs to look at their own heart and life. We looked at three faiths, and only one of them was saving faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5a says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Prove your own selves. I'm not looking at your life. I'm asking you, with the Holy Spirit's help, to look. See, Satan's the great deceiver. Don't you think if he could make you think you're saved? Make you think that imitation faith is real? He'd be happy for you to wake up in hell and realize it never was. Why did God give all this attention to this in James chapter 2? There wasn't a danger of it. Why did he say in Matthew 7, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we sit in church even on Sunday night? But didn't we do many mighty works? I never knew you. Depart from me. Many, many. Oh, it's so sad, many. Here are the questions. You can ask yourself, examine your own heart. Number one, was there a time when I honestly realized I was a sinner and admitted this to myself and to God? Was there a time when I honestly realized that I was a sinner and admitted this to myself and to God? Number two, was there a time when my heart stirred me to flee from the wrath to come? Have I ever seriously Seriously and fearful over my sins that hell could be my home. Number three, do I truly understand that gospel, the gospel, that Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures? Do I understand and confess that I cannot save myself, not through me, not through anything I've done? Number four, did I sincerely repent of my sins and turn from them, or do I secretly love sin and want to enjoy it? Number five. Have I trusted Christ and Christ alone for my salvation? Do I enjoy a living relationship with Him through His Word and His Spirit? It's something that's alive. It's a relationship. Number six. Has there been a change in my life? 
Do I maintain good works or are my works occasional and weak? Do I seek to grow in the things of the Lord? Can others tell that I have been with Jesus? Number seven, do I have a desire to share Christ with others or am I ashamed of them? Number eight, do I enjoy the fellowship of God's people? Is worship a delight to me? Number nine, am I ready for the Lord's return? Or will I be ashamed when He comes for me? Am I fearful when I hear about the return of Christ? Now, I know everyone's experience may be a little bit different. Certainly, we're all growing and there are levels of sanctification, if you will, as God is working to sanctify us, to, to bring us... Uh, in, we're positionally we're sanctified, but God is working to bring us daily living apart from sin, separated unto the Lord and from the world. But for the most part, that list, that spiritual inventory can help a person. Am I standing in true faith? Am I in the faith? And we pray with David, Lord, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May we bow in prayer.